Kevin, dedication and your part of the share. Uh, dedication to all the soldiers fighting for us. May they be victorious and come back safely and help release the hostages intact and Amazing. alive. And I hope, I hope Hamas breaks the ceasefire agreement with one rocket so that they won't have a chance to breathe and we decimate them, to be honest, because I don't know the condition of the hostages and if they're going to come out of it in one piece. I don't know. And there's hostages. They must get them alive. They mustn't accept what dead body, dead hostages. They need to be living. Yeah. Anyway, Hashem's taking care of all the details. Teach us, Kevin. And I hope those mums are in burning hell. Amazing. Yeah. Okay. So, one thing at that this week's parsha is parshat uh, parshat vayetse, uh, and one of the things in this parsha is uh, the deception and crookery of Lavan towards Yaakov, who who worked for seven years to marry Ra uh, Rachel. He was supposed to, and then he was given Leah. Then he worked for another seven years for Rachel, who he actually loved more. And then he was he gathered, he got all his possessions that he gained and the wealth for the 14 years he worked there. And Lavan changed his wages 10 times. And then he decided to leave after the after the 14 years. He started to leave. He didn't tell Lavan he left. And Lavan uh accused him of thievery and basically projected his dishonesty onto Yaakov. And then you get people like this in the world. Uh, he basically said that the, his daughters and the grandchildren were his property and uh, and projected how bad ja Yaakov was. And you get people, you get people uh, uh, like that in the world, dishonest people who uh, project their dishonesty and um uh who project uh, by, 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 with their false accusations they're the ones who are actually in the wrong you get people like this in the world yeah you do do um absolutely anything that you want to say guys anything else guys uh no, just that we have a victory here. And just I just want to let just let you know that on, on J Post they said that eighty five percent of Palestinians are pro Hamas. So just letting you know that's it's not a there's a massive problem there. Actually we we, we do have a victory here, by the way. So I shot a lot of victory. The supermarkets. So, that's your favorite there, yeah. Arthur. Victory, yeah. All right, guys, let's get to the Gamora here. Um, Kev, thanks for teaching us. So remember, Rubber had this discussion against a buyer who said that if somebody declares that they've given up, they might not really feel like that in their heart. And therefore, you can't assume the default position is you've got to assume that they haven't given up your ush or despaired of retrieving the item. Now, Rabbi was challenged twice, as you saw. Now, this is the third challenge. And it says, come learn a proof from the following Brysa. In the case of a thief, a robber, and an expropriator. Now, if you remember, uh, an expropriator is somebody that basically legally expropriates property and compensates the owner a pittance for what the item is worth. That's, that's the one way that it can be done. The other way is that, uh, the, in other words, the item is paid not for its true value, and, uh, or sometimes a sale can be forced by um, uh, non-consensual means. In other words, it, it, it might not be necessarily a tax collector from the government. An expropriator could be 
somebody that wants your adjoining property and you don't want to sell the property and they want to build a shopping center where your property is in Santon and um, they make you an offer of a couple of million rand, you don't take it. And then there's some guys that arrive and put a gun to your head and say, uh, um, you need to sign this document. No. Uh, so it's a sale by force. So we're saying that that isn't constituting anything other than theft if it does not, um, if it's if it does not comply to consensual acquisition from both parties, a buyer and a seller, in a reasonable manner. So a thief, a robber, and an expropriator, that which they consented is consecrated. In other words, if they consecrated the stolen article. Their consecration actually takes effect, guys, and the item becomes prohibited for benefit. We learned that if you consecrate it to Higdash, you can't have personal use out of it. Uh, and that which they basically designate as Turuma is Turuma. Now, if you remember, if they stole Tevil and designated part of it as Taruma, the designation is actually effective and it becomes Taruma and prohibited for non koanim Okay? And that which they designate as Misa is Misa. You know a Misa is a certain percentage of your earnings that goes to Tzedaka. Now, there is a rule, as you know from the Brysa, and in general, is that one cannot consecrate nor designate as Taruma or Misa that which is not his. So evidently then, the Brasa refers to where the owner despaired of recovering the stolen goods, whether it was by a robber, a thief, or an expropriator who didn't get mutual consent. And it holds that despair effects acquisition. Okay? So this Brasa indicates that you wish alone, despite the fact that it's not accompanied by a change of domain necessarily, or a change of name or physical properties, uh, um, or financial um, transaction necessarily of equitable value. So obviously, we're saying that despair alone affects acquisition. So we're saying, okay, so how's this a proof against rubber? Because all rubber is saying is that your default possession Sorry, your default position is assuming that your ush despair has not taken place. Even somebody that says it, they might just be venting. So we want to know who's the ton of this bricer who assumes that the owner has despaired in the case of both a robber and a thief. Guys, if you say, according to our mission, it's the rabbis who assume despair only in the case of a thief, then the bricer's assumption that a victim of a robber has despaired is problematic. Okay, And if you use our Mishnah as contextual reference and say that it's according to Rabbi Shimon, who assumes despair only in the case of a robber, then the Bryce's assumption that a victim of a thief has despaired is problematic. Either way, when you use this Bryce against our Mishnah, it's problem problematic for Rava. Okay, So the Gemara is going to provide a partial answer. And it says, okay, so it's fine according to Ula who says that when the owner is known to have despaired by having a public declaration, that's how you would know. You can't read some of his thoughts. All agree that the despair affects acquisition. Because we can say here too in the Brysa, the reference is to where the owner is known to have despaired, and thus its ruling are consistent with the opinions of everybody, the rabbis and Rabbi Shimon. Because if it's consistent with both of them, it works with the Bryce, whether it's the case of the robber and thief, because the Bryce mentions both. So either category uh, would align with our uh, Mishnah. But according to Rabbi, who said that this dispute applies even when the owner is known to have despaired by uh, his public declaration, but we don't know his heart, what he's really thinking. We want to know who is the ton of this Bryce. Because basically we're having a situation uh, just Hang on a second, please. For both character, then. Your character is what's stopping a homicide. All right. So who's the ton of this, Bryce? Guys, it's not the rabbis, nor Rabbi Shimon. 
It can't be. So, Damon, just repeat the Brysa for me, please. Sorry, I got sidetracked. No, it's no problem. I'll repeat it with pleasure. In the case of a thief, a robber, and an expropriator, that which they consecrate is consecrated. Uh, that which they designate as Teruma is Teruma, and that which they designate as Misa is Misa. So, guys, you can't consecrate nor designate Teruma and Misa that which is not yours. Okay, if you steal something, if you rob something, it's not yours to consecrate it. So obviously, the Brysa has to refer to a case where the owner despaired of recovering the stolen goods. And therefore, it holds that the uh, that the act of Yush, the act of despair, affects acquisition. Okay? Now, the tongue of this Brysa doesn't have a problem according to Ula. Because if the person declared that he has despaired, we believe it. So therefore, there's, it's not problematic. But if you want to go according to Rava, Rabba, who says that, look, uh, there's no despair, even if there's declaration, because we don't know what the person really thinks. That's a problem, because if you compare this Brysa, Kevin, to the our Mishnah in Daf 114, and if you say, look, let's align it with the rabbis, because the rabbis assume despair only in the case of a thief. Why? Because in the case of a thief that tunnels in, the guy's not going to get his goods back. So then the, uh, the Bryce's assumption that a victim of a robber has despaired is problematic. Okay? Because as far as a robber is concerned, you're not going to despair because according to the Rabonim, if you recognize the person and he's just a bit glued up or drugged up or drunk and he takes you out and by force, you know he is. He's not a gangster. He's just a bit drugged up and you can sue him in court. Then the Bryce's assumption, if you align this, um, with a Rabbi Shimon, he says you can only assume to spare in the case of a robber, because a robber that he's referring to is actually like a gangster who's not afraid of the law, and who witnesses go missing, and who plaintiffs uh, go missing. You're not going to sue the guy, okay? So therefore, he's brazen. So therefore. You're assuming to spare in that case, but a thief you're not, because Rabbi Shimon, I said to you, monk the example of you having three people over for Friday night, you've got a Fabergé egg uh, that's gone. It can only be one of those three people. So when you hope to find the identity of the person who was actually at Friday night by taking O's, cross testimony of witnesses, etc., can't sue them to get your Fabergé egg back. So there's only despair in the case of a robber because you don't want to go missing. But in the case of three people that come to your house for Shabbos and the egg goes missing, you can quite easily have enough uh, evidence to know it's one of the three. And you can sue them in court. So according to Rabbi Shimon, we despair only in the case of a robber, but not in the case of a thief. And again, this is problematic according to Rabbi, because according to Rabbi, there's never a case of despair ever, whether you go according to uh, the rabbis or you go according to Rabbi Shimon. There's never a case of despair because you can't be believed when the victim says uh, he gives up getting it back. It's okay because we say we don't know what he's thinking. That's what Rabbi is saying to Rav Ula in a buyer. Now, Ula is saying, listen, what a person says, Kevin, one thing, what a person says, you've got to believe him. And if he says he gives up and he despairs, he despairs. You believe him. All right. What's funny, Kev? Something's amusing you? Um, so if if the Fabergé egg was stolen by one of those supposed guests, he should the owner of 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 the of, of, well, the the, the Balavai should be able to use brute force to get it back. That's a great example, Kevin. Excellent. Ultimately, <laughs> I, I, I can explain it. Because Fabergé makes fragrances. No, I know, I know, and Brut. And one of them is Brut, fragrance. yeah. No, that's why I said it's a wonderful example. Exactly, yeah, ex example. Exactly, yeah. exactly. Okay. Not if Excellent. You use old spots. Excellent, job. Kevin. All right. Okay. L let's let's not. Uh, uh, get... Let's scramble along and get on. With it. Okay. <laughs> Thanks. Arthur's brain's fried. It's been a long day. Let's get on with it. Okay. So, 
So we're saying uh, it, it's 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 a bit of a difficulty. It's a bit of a difficulty because how how would the Brysa be matched with the Mishnah according to the opinion of Robert to say that we don't believe there is a case where the victim despairs? So the Gemara provides this partial answer, guys. Now, this is fine according to Ulla, who says that when the owner is known to have uh, despaired by publicly stating it as such, believe them, and all agree that the despair affects acquisition. Because we can say here, too, in the Brysa, the reference is where the owner is known to have despaired, and thus its rulings are consistent with the opinions of everybody, Rabbi Shimon and the, and, uh, the rabbis, and therefore... If you if you um, uh, it works according to the Bryce's said what you designate as a robber thief or a expropriator what he designates as um, uh, what he as terum is terum what he consecrates he consecrates and what he designates as mice is mice and therefore how can he designate something that or consecrate something that's not his well only if the victim gave up and therefore it becomes the possession of the for the robber, the expropriator, obviously can be sued in court and give the cash equivalent, but that article is his. So it works with Ulla. But according to Rabba, who says that the dispute applies even when the owner is known to have despaired, we want to know who the tanner is of this Brysa. It's obviously not the rabbis, guys, and it's not Rabbi Shimon. So the Gemara answers that we must answer that the Brysa refers to an armed bandit. In other words, the thief mentioned in the Brysa is an armed bandit because it talks about um, uh, bandits, uh, a troop of bandits. I, I used the word a troop of uh, ANC people. Um, as, far, uh, as, as far as that's concerned, um, uh, as far as that's concerned, we are saying that uh, uh, an armed bandit, uh, according to Rabbi Shimon, is the same as a robber. So what you are saying is is that an armed bandit is different to a normal bandit. Let me tell you why. Mm. Because the robbers, uh, let's take the case of a robber. The rabbis are saying, don't give up hope as far as a robber taking something from you. Why, Gavin? Because you can uh, you can get it back. Uh. No, you can recognize him. So in other words, if yeah. it's the local Okechul pub. That's no, but that's how drinks. you can get it back. Directly. Yeah, yeah. So what I'm saying is if it's the local, the rabbis use it. I'm using a different example that I've thought of, like I told you the other day. There's a difference between a mafioso, which is like a Rabbi Shimon example, and a robber who you have a drink at the bar, you're having dinner there, and they have a pub dinner, etc. And the other guy's getting plastered, and he comes to you, and he's a bit of a heavy number, and he says, uh, grabs your laptop, and he says, it's mine. It's mine, and you took it. You might not remember it sobered up, and although you're a little nervous of him, if you're living in a country where they could arrest him for it, and they could ex uh, extract it from him with the sheriff of the court, and you recognize him, you are able to get your item back because you recognize who he is. You can't have so many tunnels in your house, and it's a thief. So uh, the rabbis say you're not scared in a case like that because your law system works for you. It's not a mafia guy that you would end up disappearing as a witness. I do recommend you perhaps don't go back to that pub again because he'll flatter you. Uh, that, that's probably a good idea to change pubs. But that aside, you wouldn't be as scared. It's not a mafia guy. But an armed robber, is uh, a case where even Rabbi Shimon is saying there's a problem because if it's a mafia guy and he's got henchmen, um, you're not going to toy with him because he doesn't want to do serious time and he's probably a felon. He's probably a felon with a couple of felon charges and sometimes a misdemeanor can send him away for a long time and he's used to killing people. So even the rabbis would discern the difference between a, a, a little drunk person that you recognize that robbed an item from you compared to a mafia guy. And therefore, the Gemara refers to the different uh, kind of robbers. So an armed bandit would even work with a case of robber 
you said in that case, the person hasn't really given up hope, even though he says he's given up hope or we don't know or whatever the case may be, because we figure that it's different to a normal thief. So therefore, if you want to say it's a robbed, uh, if you want to say it's it's a, a robber that's armed, that would work according to Rabbi Shimon. And it doesn't have to work with the, the, the Mishnah according to the Rabbis and Rabbi Shimon. It doesn't have to work with both of them. All it has to do is work with one opinion. But then you have to say that the rabbi is on, not the rabbi, the rabbi is on in order to see it according to Rabbi Shimon. And the Gemara says, so why mention the the the, the robber twice? Why mention a robber twice? It states already in the uh, Gemara, you talk about a robber and a thief. And the Gemara says you have to, because the Bryce and the Mishnah talk about two different types of robbers. The one is a low-key person that robbed you when he saw the opportunity. The other one is a mafia guy with henchmen and a bad track record of felonies and doesn't want to do serious time and has no qualms about killing witnesses or his victim. It also discusses the case of legal robbers, and those are tax collectors that come with henchmen against your will, even though they've got the sanction of the government or the king. And they're deemed robbers because if the king knew what was going on, he probably would lose his agency, but how are you going to get access to the king, guys? So it's a bit it's a bit difficult. And in that case, you can't always go on the word of somebody in a declaration. And we used that example the other day of a teenage boy that's really mad about this girl. And the mate say, listen, mate, I'm sorry you lost your girlfriend. He says, nah, she, 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 you know, she really wasn't so great when you really got to know. In fact, he's heartbroken. He just wants to seem like a main money in front of his friends. The big deal. He doesn't want to show his vulnerability. Um, so that's one answer. There is an alternative answer in the Gomorrah, and that is if you prefer to say the tanner of this Bryce is actually Rebbe. Okay? Um, so in other words, uh, if, if you look at this, Rebbe describes it as something a little different, that the thief of this Brysa is an actual thief who steals clandestinely. In other words, it's not the example of the Fabergé egg where you had three people over for Friday night. It's about a person that tunnels in your home. If so, guys, the original problem returns. Since the Brysa assumes that the owner despairs in the cases of both a robber and a thief, it seems to contradict the opinions of both the rabbis and Rabbi Shimon, However, it is consistent with the view of the third town, a Rebbe, and we're going to see what the uh, why, why, what's uh, um, what's the issue. I mean, part of what we discussed is in Kalim, this twenty-six duff and this eighth section concerning hard stolen by a robber and a thief, about when you basically despair, and therefore once they have it and it's uh, in its process where it's a, a hard, and in your mind you can think it's a mat and has utility, becomes a cleave, then it's susceptible to tumor. We're not saying when it's a, a mat and you want to turn it to, uh, sorry, it's a hard and you want to turn it into a shoe, which requires further processing. But it has to be the rubble of thieves in terms of acquisition, and that can only occur in terms of uh, your wish taking place by the victim. And when it belongs to the thief or robber, his intent can affect the uh, outcome of it being seen as a utensil of utility. So Rebbe is saying, look, there's no difference if you take the term of a thief or robber. It's being taken against your will, and that's the main concern. And we've established that Rebbe means a thief is like a robber, according to Rabbi Shimon. Okay? So let me just tell you what this means. It means that Rebbe's statement can be interpreted in one of two ways. Guys, listen carefully. That the thought of a thief does not render the heart susceptible to tumor, as the robbers hold in the case, uh, as the rabbis hold in the case of a robber. That's the one way. I will repeat it again. So Rebbe's statement can be interpreted in either the way that thought of a thief does not render the heart susceptible to tumor. Um, as the rabbis hold in the case of a robber. And then the second point is the thought of a thief does render them susceptible to tumor, as Rabbi Shimon holds in the case of a robber. So it depends if you're holding according to the Tanakama, which is the general rabbinical thought, 
or Rabbi Shimon, but the Gemara basically has established that if you're talking about an armed bandit, it for sure supports Rabbi Shimon, and it emerges that according to Rebbe, the victim of both a thief and a robber despairs of recovering his property because you can't have the thief, it's the tunneling kind, and of the robber, it's of the armed robbery kind, uh, and therefore uh, it would support both the rabbis and uh, Rabbi Shimon, according to the right contextual application. And if the Bryce follows Rebbe in its ruling, a thief or a robber can consecrate what he stole. And that poses no difficulty by rubber because at the end of the day, there are situations where rubber would say the circumstances are so unlikely for recovery that an opinion of despair probably denotes despair in the probability of getting it back. Okay. Damon, now, I have another idea. Yeah. On this topic. Okay. Uh, isn't it a rule that you're supposed to return the object to your stall, if you, whatever, exactly the way it was? And therefore, if it's got tumor, it's not exactly the way it's It can't contain the tumor because it doesn't change it physically. So therefore, none of it's a tumor for the thief. Okay. So this, 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 this uh, so let me just see if I understand what you're asking. So yeah. in principle, authors right in a certain respect. In other words, if you get an article and you and you change the physical properties, it belongs to the thief or robber in the case where uh, it's now his because it's changed the physical properties. But that only helps author if there's your ush mm -hmm. on the part of the victim. If there's no your ush, no, 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 I'm not saying that. The rule is if there's no your ush, right, and you steal some from somebody. You got to return the item, the exact same item. Okay, so the spirit of tumor could not affect it because it, they would make you know. So therefore, when it gets returned, it's you know. Did you understand what I'm trying to say there? I don't know if you I get. I don't understand what you're saying at all because okay. there's a difference okay. between a mitzvah yeah. the and was finding the, a lost the hang on. Arthur, let me just finish okay. what I'm saying. One yeah. second, mate. There's a difference between finding a lost object, at which by by the way. You should acquire it by mm. physical acquisition, it says in Baba Metziah, but we return it to our brother as a kindness to a fellow Jew, okay? Uh, yeah. But that has nothing to do with actively stealing or robbing an item from somebody. So the analogy doesn't work, but explain to me what you're saying. Okay. No, what, what I was, well, sorry, I don't know if I'm here. What I was thinking is, the rule is if you steal something and you get caught, you first return the item, the original item. Okay. Yeah. So, if the thief is stolen, right, and you got something like Tuma, okay, the Tuma wouldn't stay on there, okay, because he has to return the original item, which was without Tuma in the beginning. So, therefore, the Tuma can't be transferred from the future. I'm just thinking differently. I don't know if, it's, if I'm right okay, or wrong. Okay, so, so the, the issue is if yeah. the... the, the the default position is that say, yeah. uh, say the original owner, uh, who's the victim of this robbery or theft, has given up hope of getting it back, and evidence comes to okay. light, and he can work out who it is, and he can sue him without landing up dead, and he does so. Okay. okay? In that particular case, um. He can get the original as uh, object back, providing it hasn't been physically changed in property. In other words, it looks different okay. or it is different. It hasn't had a change of domain to a, a third party. Some people say the robbery's house is not enough of a change of domain. Um, or, or there hasn't been a case of a... Um, um, uh, yeah, so and some hold that your wish itself uh, suffices uh, with with without the other mitigating factors, uh, such as selling okay. it where there's a transaction to a third party. So no, no, I'm, I'm, I'm not talking about that. But you can. So, just, so all I'm no. saying is, um, all I'm saying is, if the victim wakes up at a later point, and your ush has taken place with one of those other factors, that object does belong to the uh, thief or robber, and then he still has to give the cash equivalent back to the victim, even if he doesn't give that original item. So tell me what you're saying. Just make it a little clear. Okay, so let me make it clear. The guy hasn't, hasn't given up. 
Yeah. Okay. So the rule is if he hasn't given up and you catch a thief, you have to return the original item. So let's say there was a guy saw a hide, he made a mat, and then there was a sheriff on it, and yada, yada, yada. That sheriff doesn't stay there, okay? Um, because you have to return the original item, and that would be without Tuma. So the Tuma wouldn't stay on it. If he hasn't given it, I'm just thinking. Now, well, that, what, you, what you're I'm saying is correct, to... because in order, in order yes. for that item to contract Tuma, it has to be taken from a raw state to a processed state, okay? Number uh, number one, and become a CLI, a utensil okay. or something of utility. But there's some items like a hard that if you want to turn it into a placemat, it looks the same mm -hmm. before you process it to after. There's no further processing, the processing that's needed. It's just thought. Okay. But that thought can only be... Uh, attached to that item in terms of utensil according to who owns that item that heart and it can only belong to the thief or robber if the victim has given up if he hasn't there's no thought on the part of the thief or the robber that can turn it into mm -hmm. a cle uh, at all because that's in the realm of the owner and if there's no yush okay. the robber thief cannot do anything about it and therefore it would not become a cle a vessel or, okay. or, or anything of utility or use, and therefore doesn't contract too much, even if dropped on a share. Okay, so that's oh, correct. Was that's the absolutely intention. correct. I, Arthur yeah. understood the Gemara perfectly. All right, guys. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Damon, one quick yeah. question. What Arthur yeah. was, what happens if the guy returns the article intact? And let's say, yeah, okay, so Arthur was saying that the rat, a dead share fell on the, the, the material yeah. and could have could have uh made it tumor. But because the intention wasn't there, uh no, no, no. The it owner, has nothing to do with that. No. It has to do with the fact that even if the thief for robber intended to take the heart and make it a placemat in his head, if there's no Yosha in the part of the victim to having given up hope of getting that object back, it's not the thief's or robber's property in order to uh, be able to manipulate by thought if it required no further processing to become a cle, a vessel of utility, of function. And therefore, it doesn't matter if it was dipped in a sheriff's blood or anything else, it would not contract too much. Which uh, triggers Gavin's question, which what happens if it's physically damaged or burnt? Whatever your thought process is, it's burnt. It's burnt. And in that case, we mentioned... Rav Oshia and Rav Chia. Remember in the in the Duff, in the third uh, in the third Duff, uh, the, sorry, the second and third Duff, when it compares articles that suffer um, deterioration on a physical standpoint, like wine into vinegar, at which it's discernible, compared to whether it becomes uh, uh, um, not eligible for use by a Jew or coin. Which is known as uh, indiscernible damage, at which some people say that's not true damage, according to certain opinions. Some say it is. So we go back to that about from the very beginning. Guys, you all asked wonderful questions. I wish you a fantastic night, and Marshall bless you all. Thanks, man. Uh, about the tunnels, you were talking about somebody digging in. Yeah.